Hi everyone, my name is Jack, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. On the far reaches of the Aegean Sea, where the horizon seems endless and the water stretches all the way to the sky, the Royal Caribbean was moving. George Smith and Jennifer, a young couple who had just become husband and wife, stood on deck, feeling the wind in their hair and contemplating this majestic nature. The Aegean Sea spread out before them like a vast life full of promise and plans. Thus began their wedding journey, which became not an ordinary cruise, but a story turned into a mystery. On July 5, 2005, around 8 a.m., on Deck 7, in one of the cabins of the cruise ship Royal Caribbean, 16-year-old Emily Rausch of Chicago was preparing for a new sunny day. Outside her cabin window, Emily noticed something strange that caused her alarm. She saw something that looked like blood smeared across the canopy that served as a sort of shield for the lifeboat. Nearby, she also saw a bloodstain near the very edge of the canopy, as if someone, having been injured, had fallen there before disappearing overboard. Emily could not remain indifferent to this discovery and hastened to report the strange footprints to the staff of the liner. A host of other passengers from neighboring cabins also discovered these frightening signs. A lively and exciting discussion began on Deck 7 about what might have happened. Thus began a story that made front-page headlines in many international publications just days after a happy young couple embarked on their honeymoon Mediterranean cruise. The happiness of young people was suddenly cut short by an inexplicable, terrible event that unfolded in cabin number 9062. The versions of what happened were varied and confusing, including an accident, possible robbery, or even premeditated murder, and the investigation became a puzzle for the police. Traces and evidence collected on board pointed to multiple suspects, each hiding their own secrets. It seems that many on the liner knew far more than they were willing to say. What really happened that dark night on board? That is the question that detectives, journalists, and all those following this mysterious story are asking themselves. George Smith was a cheerful, inquisitive, and bright young man. He was born in the small town of Greenwich, Connecticut. His childhood was a happy one, filled with the joy and support of his family, which came first for George, and he always maintained a close relationship with his parents and his sister Bree. His father, George Smith Sr. owned a liquor store and ran it himself. The family business was not just a job for him, but a true passion. In 2000, the younger George Smith successfully completed his higher education in business at Babson College, which is located in Massachusetts. After graduation, he worked for several years in Boston as a computer data mining analyst. However, his heart has always belonged to the family business. After making an informed decision, George decided to return home to help his parents run the store. Under his father's guidance, he was going to learn the ins and outs of the family business so that he could take over the store in the future and allow his parents to enjoy a well-deserved vacation. In 2002, at one of his reunions with friends, George Smith met a girl who became his life partner. Jennifer was also a Connecticut native and had just received a job offer as an elementary school teacher. She was bright, beautiful and ambitious, just like George himself. The young people were completely enamored with each other. George's parents were also delighted with his chosen one. Three years later, in 2005, when George was 26 years old, the couple decided to get married and start a new chapter of their lives. They celebrated their wedding at the Castle Hill Inn, located in the picturesque town of Newport, Rhode Island. And the ceremony itself took place on the oceanfront. It was a location perfect for such an important event in their lives. Immediately after the ceremony, the newlyweds went on a wedding trip, choosing a cruise on a luxury liner, one of the majestic ships of the Royal Caribbean. The tour, lasting 12 days, involved sailing the beautiful waters of the Aegean Sea. Their journey began in Barcelona on June 29th and included stops on France's Côte d'Azur and then along the coast of Italy. Aboard the liner, George and Jennifer quickly struck up a friendship with another couple and a young man named Askin from California. 20-year-old Josh Askin, a man with a keen sense of humor, quickly won George's friendship, and onward the merry company enjoyed spending time together. The 1st of July, when the liner moored off the Italian coast, they decided to go on land together and have fun. 
All day July, zero four young people traveled around the island, walked through the narrow streets of its old town, swam in the cleanest Aegean Sea, and tasted the local cuisine in cozy taverns. Happy and cheerful, they enjoyed each other and the atmosphere of this beautiful place. Mykonos left unforgettable memories in their hearts, and they planned to also have fun continuing this evening together on the deck of the liner. After a romantic dinner, George and Jennifer met up with their friends again on the liner. The merry company decided to unite and have a good laugh to remember this exotic corner of the world. The evening was full of laughter and excitement. After enjoying delicious appetizers and drinks, the newlyweds in the company of Josh Askin went to have fun in the casino on board the liner. George and Josh enjoyed sitting at the craps table. They were also kept entertained during the game, while Jennifer enjoyed playing at the poker table. By the end of the evening, the newlyweds had lost a not insignificant amount of money without regret. They joked about losing, after all, it was their honeymoon. After the casino closed, apparently, the friends decided to continue their night out. The last video of George was recorded around 2.30 a.m. on one of the liner's many security cameras. The footage showed him leaving the casino, but that did not mean George would return to his cabin. In the early morning hours of June 5, 2005, on the Greek island of Mykonos, a mysterious plot began to unfold. George Smith, 26, a newlywed who was on an Aegean cruise with his wife Jennifer, disappeared. Last night, George was reportedly having an active time enjoying the liner's atmosphere of fun and luxury. Everything seemed harmless that night, but the sequel turned out to be much darker. The captain of the ship examined the cabin, under the window of which strange footprints had been found, as well as the place on deck. There was no one in the cabin. The available footprints and evidence indicated that something serious had happened. The possible disappearance of the newlyweds was related to violence. The news quickly reached all the liner's visitors. There was alarm aboard the ship. Passengers were disturbed by the strange events. Deck 7 was cordoned off. No one was let in or out of their cabins. The ship's crew thoroughly checked every possible establishment on the liner in hopes of finding the missing George and Jennifer. After the discovery of blood, the newlyweds were presumed to have mysteriously disappeared. Taking the situation into his own hands, the senior officer headed to their stateroom to get to the bottom of what was going on. From all available traces, it was hypothesized that George might have fallen overboard the ship. Meanwhile, on the other side of the ship, the search for the young couple was still going on. By 10 a.m., Jennifer was found in the ship's spa, where she was having a pre-booked massage session. Her facial expression spoke of deep surprise and concern. She claimed to be unaware of her husband's whereabouts and that she had not seen him since the previous night. Jennifer revealed that when she woke up this morning, her husband wasn't there. At first, it did not seem unusual to her, because he had spent the night with friends, and in the morning he was in another cabin, so she did not search for her husband, but went for a spa treatment without being bothered by his absence. At noon, Turkish authorities arrived on board to begin an investigation. The ship's captain reassured the anxious passengers and announced that the abnormal events required cooperation with local authorities. He emphasized that it was a measure necessary to clarify the circumstances and expressed hope that the situation would be resolved soon. The police officers began their questioning with the missing man's wife, Jennifer. Her agitated state and apparent lack of information about her husband made her the main suspect. She said that she had not seen George since the previous night, and that men in white uniforms from the Royal Caribbean had shown up at her door announcing that her husband may have fallen overboard the ship. They also noticed traces of blood on the boat's awning, after which there was no room for doubt. Something terrible had happened to George. Investigators scrutinized cabin 9062 on the cruise ship. This cabin was a mess. Perhaps it was the result of a hurried search or even a struggle. In the bathroom, small drops of blood were found on the carpet and towel, and there were fingerprints on the balcony railing. Turkish investigators also found two small bloodstains on the bedding, each about two centimeters long. These samples were identified. The blood belonged to George. All evidence indicated that George had been traumatized inside the cabin before his mysterious disappearance. 
The investigator's attention was particularly drawn to a chair on the balcony, which had been moved so that it was possible to sit next to the railing. They found marks on the railing as if someone had sat on it. This raised suspicion among many, including the ship's captain, that George might have fallen from the balcony. But the high railing and the presence of blood, both on the boat's awning and inside the cabin, also raised suspicion of a murder that had occurred. Investigators began reconstructing the sequence of events that night, trying to figure out who George was spending time with and what might have led to this tragedy. The investigation was just beginning, but it was already obvious that they were facing a complex and dark story, full of mysteries and unexpected twists and turns. When the Turkish authorities entered the ship to begin investigating the disappearance of George Smith, they decided to start by questioning the company of boys with whom the newlyweds had spent time the previous night. The situation remained mysterious, and every detail could be important in solving the mystery. Members of the company revealed that George and Jennifer had consumed too much alcohol that tragic night. According to them, George was intoxicated, and they helped him back to his cabin where they put him to bed, removed his shoes, and left him alone. They also reported that they could not find Jennifer, and assumed that she had returned to the cabin later. However, there are a number of discrepancies in Josh Askin's testimony. Specifically, he claimed that he saw Jennifer leave with a casino employee named Lloyd. Josh believed that there was a passionate connection between the two of them, and they didn't even hide their feelings in George's presence. But video camera footage showed that at 3.30 a.m., Jennifer stumbled away, leaving George with her new friends. And Lloyd's key card data indicated that he returned to his cabin at 3.25 a.m., which was confirmed by his girlfriend, whom he woke up upon entering the cabin. These discrepancies raised further questions for investigators and led them to believe that Josh Askin may have had his own motives for hiding some important details. The investigation continued, and each new detail added more and more mystery to the story. Greg Rosenberg, a young man of 19, was enjoying a cruise on a liner with his family and friends. In this company were his cousin, Zach Rosenberg, and a close friend, Rostislav Kaufman. All three, despite their Russian roots, held American passports and lived in New York City. The fun began in the casino, where Jennifer and Greg Rosenberg decided to try their luck at poker. The mutual gambling lasted until late at night, and when the casino closed at 2.30 a.m., the group of guys decided to continue the fun together. They headed to the disco, continuing to dance and enjoy alcohol. Lloyd Botha, the casino manager, was also spotted in their company. He joined in the fun as the young men continued their nightly entertainment. Next, the events of the night, as described by the witnesses, begin to diverge as the individual members of the group begin to gradually disperse to their cabins. Already deep into the night, the boys were visibly drunk and rowdy. According to the rules of order on the ship, it was decided to block the delivery for such people who are loud and behave inappropriately. And when the staff of the liner refused to serve two drunken visitors, the young people remembered that they had with them a bottle of absinthe, purchased on a walk on the island of Mykonos. However, cruise passengers were forbidden to drink their own alcohol. At a certain point, Josh returns to his cabin, which was on the same deck, to retrieve a special bottle of absinthe that he said he had plans for. As it later turns out, the absinthe was unusually strong, with an alcohol concentration of over 70%, making it one of the strongest drinks available. George decides to help his friend and hides the bottle behind the waistband of his shorts. After three o'clock in the morning, when the liner was already completely quiet, an observant janitor noticed something unusual. A group of young men, including Greg, Zach, Rostislav, Josh, and George, were drinking their bottle of absinthe. This circumstance did not go unnoticed, and it became another element in the investigation. However, it wasn't just the guys who were drunk that evening. Jennifer, who had seemed relatively sober and calm at the beginning of the evening, began to change noticeably. She began to stagger and at one point even leaned on the casino manager Lloyd. Her behavior gave different impressions to witnesses. Some thought she was trying to keep her balance, while others saw it as flirting. It also remains unclear what happened afterward between the young spouses. According to witnesses, there was a conflict between the couple. 
Perhaps they were just discussing the previous evening and jokingly or seriously, but at some point Jennifer hit George. It was unclear whether this happened in a playful manner or perhaps in anger. After that, Jennifer left the disco. At about 3.30 a.m., Jennifer, stumbling and visibly intoxicated, left the place of entertainment, leaving George in the company of his new friends. This moment was the turning point that night. The testimony of staff witnesses proved pivotal in uncovering the details of the incident. Jennifer, walking staggering down the hallway, attracted the attention of the janitor, who had earlier noticed the young men enjoying their absinthe. He gave her support, helped her to the elevator, and watched her turn right when she reached her deck. However, there was a strange discrepancy. Her stateroom was on the left, but she headed in the opposite direction. Jennifer was later found sleeping in the hallway, far from her room. Two guards and a female duty officer used a wheelchair to get her back to her quarters. When they got there, the clock was already showing 4.52 a.m., but George wasn't there. The curtains on the balcony doors were drawn tightly, and they remained stationary, even with the breeze. This raised questions. Was George able to go out to the balcony on his own after his new friends left him in bed? Deputy Chief of Police, Chit Hyman and his wife were resting in a neighboring cabin and witnessed the unfolding events. The couple had been asleep for quite some time, but at 4 a.m. they were suddenly awakened by a noise on their floor. They first heard loud noises from stateroom number 9062, where the newlyweds were staying. Chit Hyman immediately called guest services to report the noise. He also pounded on the wall and yelled to his neighbors, which resulted in brief silence. Then there was loud talking again, lasting about three minutes, and suddenly there was a loud argument on the balcony. Chit and his wife heard someone say good night several times, as if trying to chase people out of the cabin. This was followed by sounds like moving furniture, and finally a loud thud resembling the falling of an object. Chit Hyman decided to check what was going on and opened the door. He saw three men he could not identify. Several other passengers also reported a loud noise that sounded like a body hitting the canopy of the boat, followed by a woman's scream. But none of the eyewitnesses had conclusive evidence that a woman was inside the cabin at the time. According to witnesses, four young men entered the cabin, but only three of them were visible as they exited. The question arose, could one of them have stayed inside, trying to find money from the newlyweds, which after a generous game in the casino, may have wanted to steal intruders? The version about a failed robbery attempt seems the most plausible. However, there are alibis for the three boys, Greg, Zach, and Rostislav, who were allegedly in another stateroom just minutes after Cheat Hyman saw the three unknown men. The keycard records for George's stateroom confirm that the boys entered it at 4.05 a.m., according to their testimony, and that they entered the cabin again was not recorded. Thus, there are several theories as to what may have happened to George Smith. Version 1. Robbery. The version of a possible robbery represents one of the main ones. By all appearances, George and Jennifer got drunk fairly quickly that night. But from witnesses' observations, they looked more or less sober when they left the casino at 2.30 in the morning. At 3.30 a.m., however, they were no longer able to return to their cabin on their own, suggesting possible exposure to illegal substances. This theory is supported by the testimony of other casino visitors, who claim that George and Jennifer spoke openly about having large sums of money possibly received as wedding gifts or casino winnings. Different witnesses mentioned different amounts, but they all estimated their wealth in the tens of thousands of dollars. Of course, they could have been victims of a robbery. George wore an expensive Breitling watch, and Jennifer owned an expensive engagement ring, all of which indicated they were wealthy. Maybe their quarters were turned over looking for that money. The traces of blood on the sheet could probably have come from the kidnapper's attempt to remove George's valuable watch from his wrist. Version 2. Action of Alcohol the second version of events related to the effects of alcohol and hallucinogens. The captain, upon learning of the drunkenness of the passengers and the footprints on the balcony, concluded that there may have been an unintentional accident, and for example, during the scuffle, George fell overboard. Particular attention is paid to the question of the presence of hallucinations and their potential danger due to the ingestion of absinthe. 
Experts in the field of toxicology emphasize that everything depends on the concentration of the active substance, in this case, thujone. Today, this drink is available for sale in many European countries, and its concentration is significantly limited by European Union regulations. This means that in officially sold absinthe, the concentration of thujone is so low that it is not capable of causing hallucinations. However, illegally made absinthe with a much higher concentration can be found on the black market, which in theory can cause hallucinations. This seems unlikely in this case, as the absinthe the Smith couple purchased was bought officially in Europe and could not have caused such effects. According to experts, to achieve hallucinogenic effects using official absinthe would require the consumption of a huge quantity, so large that it would hardly be tolerable for the body and would most likely lead to fatal alcohol intoxication. Thus, the version about the influence of alcohol and hallucinogens in this case seems unlikely and lacks convincing evidence. The interviewing of suspected company members in the George Smith disappearance case represents an important part of the investigation. FBI agents conducted polygraph interviews with several key individuals in this story, including Jennifer and casino manager Lloyd Botha. Both passed the polygraph successfully. However, Josh Askin failed the polygraph interview. This may indicate that he had some secrets regarding George's disappearance, but it is also possible that it was the result of special interrogation tactics used to get more information from him. There was also a videotape of three guys, including Russians, joking about what had happened. This tape proved to be important evidence, and the FBI agents took it into consideration. One of the unidentified guys on the tape uttered the phrase, We gave him a lesson in paragliding without a parachute. This phrase may hint at some kind of incident or joke involving George. In 2009, all four guys, Greg, Zach, Rostislav, and Josh Askin, were interviewed by FBI agents as witnesses as part of the investigation into the mysterious death of George Smith. Zach Rosenberg and Josh Askin refused to give direct answers and invoked the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which grants the right not to testify against oneself. Their testimony remained ambiguous, and it appears they were unwilling or unable to provide a full account of what happened. The George Smith investigation was also influenced by the testimony of Greg Rosenberg, who was among the young men who were in the company of those entertaining that night. He claimed that they ordered food to their cabin that day, which serves as a key alibi for the Russian boys. However, there are contradictions to this claim. Records in the ship's service logs do not support such orders, and the delivery service had been blocked for their cabin the day before. The staff was even instructed not to provide any service to them that night. Greg cannot say for sure which of the cabin's passengers placed the orders. When asked about the nature of the relationship between George and Jennifer, witnesses gave different answers based on their observations and recollections. Greg claimed that because of the heavy alcohol consumption, it was difficult to determine how good the relationship between the newlyweds was. He emphasized that everyone in the group was highly intoxicated. From his testimony, it was impossible to draw definite conclusions about the nature of their relationship. Josh Askin provided information that Greg left the cabin after ordering food. However, Greg denied this claim, stating that he never left. These contradictions made the investigation even more complex and required further verification and fact-finding. What was important in Greg's words was that he had no information about whether Jennifer or Lloyd Botha were involved in George's disappearance, but he insists that the event was not accidental. The young man claimed that something crazy happened that night that will be revealed to everyone sooner or later. In December 2019, Greg Rosenberg was murdered and his death also remains unsolved. Police are looking into a possible link between his murder and the death of George Smith. The mysterious disappearance of George Smith became a real mystery that cast a shadow on his family. The situation became more and more complicated, and the behavior of the relatives after this tragedy attracted the attention of both the public and law enforcement agencies. The Smith family continued to press the authorities, demanding that the truth and justice be revealed. The case of George's disappearance was transferred from the FBI's Connecticut Regional Office to the FBI's New York office. Their persistence, and more importantly, their ability to get the public's attention through the media, yielded little results. 
To try to solve this dark secret, the family offered a $100,000 reward for information that could help find and punish those responsible. They also called for a boycott of the ship owner's company, which they believed was trying to cover up the incident to keep profits. The relationship between the parents and George's young wife, Jennifer, was disrupted. After the incident, a thorough review of her behavior began. Publicly, she seemed too collected, too measured. Her reticence and unwillingness to share enough information raised suspicion. She claimed to be following the instructions of FBI agents and doing only what she was told. The Smith family, in their search for justice and truth, eventually lost faith in Jennifer when she accepted an offer from the judgment company to settle the lawsuit independently for $1 million. The move seemed to them like a betrayal and an escape from further allegations against the cruise organizers. The Smith family was disappointed by the lack of transparency in the Turkish authorities' investigation and felt that Jennifer was too quick to accept the offer. They were convinced that Jennifer was hiding something and was not showing the proper interest in finding out what had happened. Jennifer herself claimed that she remembered almost nothing from that night after 2.30 a.m. and was not even aware that the liner's staff had found her in the corridor and returned her to her cabin. The Turkish investigation has not satisfied the Smith family and their belief in justice. Skeptical of the official findings, they decided to take justice into their own hands and enlisted the help of independent forensic scientist Henry Lee. Henry Lee conducted a series of studies in the cabin and on the balcony, the work of which was not included in the official investigation. These investigations would reveal key information about what had happened and could confirm one of the two main versions of events, murder or accident. According to Henry Lee, the height of the balcony makes a fall from it unproven. It could have been the result of a third party pushing George, or being in some insane state, he could have climbed up on the chair by himself and fallen. Nevertheless, the latter version raised many questions and doubts. The expert intended to conduct an experiment with a dummy to simulate a fall from the balcony, but the company owner of the liner refused this request. George's relatives claim that this decision was made to hinder their attempts to establish the truth. Henry Lee also conducted investigations in the cabin, on the balcony, and on the boat, but the results of these investigations remained unavailable to the public. At the same time, the FBI stepped in and began conducting their own investigation. Many of their findings and discoveries also remain secret. Obviously, the FBI's focus was on the four young men who spent the night with George, Josh Askin and the three Russians, Greg, Zach Rosenberg, and Rustislav Kaufman. Their testimony was largely inconsistent with that of the other witnesses, making the situation strange and confusing. The story of George Smith's disappearance continues to be a deep mystery, shrouded in mystery and unknown circumstances. With a lengthy investigation and many theories, the Smith family and his loved ones continue to strive to find out the truth. They initially suspected Jennifer, but then were able to be convinced of her innocence and increased the payout amount of the lawsuit against the company. This amount was divided among the family, and they secured the release of the results of the investigation of the shipowner's company, including witness statements and other information. Jennifer was left with memories of her first husband and dedicated herself to charitable organizations in his memory, striving to do good. Several years later, she remarried, Despite the FBI's efforts and long investigations, they never found out what really happened or where George's body was located. Eventually, the case was closed and the incident was ruled an accident. The FBI determined that there was not enough evidence to continue the investigation, so says the official statement of the Federal Bureau. The mystery of George Smith's disappearance remains unsolved. His family remains in search of answers as to the cause of his death. The inability to honor George's memory at his grave is agonizing for his loved ones, and they remain hopeful that sooner or later they will be able to solve the mystery and finally learn the truth. Thanks for watching, guys. That was Jack with you. Subscribe to the channel. There are many shocking stories ahead.